All right. Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us this afternoon. We are excited to um, have this be our last session in our virtual work-based learning series. Um, today, um, we are going to talk about career advising and how um, all of the tools that ODE has um, can help us um, make good plans and um, have more of a systemic process for how we work with um, career advising. So I put the link in the chat for um, attendance. I know some of you were in the waiting room, so you've probably done that. Um, but I'm gonna click through these things about Zooming and um, um, our behaviors and everything because we're all so used to Zoom right now. Um, we do have a small group, so feel free to um, unmute and ask questions and um, you know, um, put questions in the chat or just unmute and ask. So our um, speaker today is Kayla Mack from the Department of Education. She's in the Office of Graduate Success and she is going to take it away from here. Kayla, thanks for joining us today. Thank you for having me. Um, I'm going to attempt to share my screen. Please let me know if you do, if you're able to see it. Okay, it says that I am. So, okay, great. Uh, so yes, <clears throat> today we're going to talk about the career advising toolkit. Um, but the first things that I wanted to speak to are the like the foundations, the core tenets of career advising. Uh, there was an amendment back in July of 2022 to that model policy, uh, not the model policy, but the, the high revised code that I want to make sure that you are all informed about. Um, I guess we can do, because I, I certainly don't want to, <laughs> to waste time. Um, is everybody familiar with what revised code says about career advising and, the, and, and all of those pieces, or is this something that we might find interest in going deeper into? Do you think we should go into those? Okay, perfect. Well, we're just going to dive right in. Wonderful. Okay. I always like when people want to learn more. <laughs> uh, and what I've done is as we're looking at these core tenants is I've put specific examples to make sure we're highlighting how do we integrate this um, area of um, career advising policy into what we are doing. So the first thing that I want to speak about is the, um, sorry, I'm gonna move this over here, is the career connections learning strategies. So one of the things that is different now is, uh, and continues to be different is, we know that career connections learning strategies are a core tenet of career advising. Um, and one of the things that we are doing is we are starting to reimagine or redesign what those career connections look like in today's model curricula. So we've currently worked with our technology uh, team and our information technology folks to look at those career connections and start to think about how can we make these more, um, more valuable in the classroom instead of just having somebody come and talk to kids from x y and c career field but let's make it more engaging how can we really connect kids to the world of work in a new way uh, so i wanted to provide an example in um, the k through five technology model curricula because one of the things that we did is we wanted to make sure that there were um high there were engaging um uh, activities across the framework. So making sure we're being intentional of having age appropriate activities for our K through five kids, our six through eight, our nine through 12. And so this exam, this is just one of those examples of how we've reimagined kids doing that. In this case, they're not only learning about technology, but they're engaging in technology to be the platform for their learning about careers around technology. <laughs> um, so we, it was a lot of fun and we're, we're really excited on where things are going with these career connections and the model curricular. So I highly advise taking a look at this um, one specifically in technology. Another thing that we've added is, um, is making sure that as we're thinking about how kids are engaging in those career connections or what are those um, Ohio means jobs ready to seal professional skills that they would be demonstrating um, or leveraging as they're engaging in that work. So we wanted to make sure we're making some unique alignments to make sure one, even with our younger kids, they're being informed about those professional skills, how they are um, used in the world of work as they are transitioning to high school and maybe considering using the readiness seal as one of their seals for graduation. They have a foundational understanding of what those expectations are. So we're trying to think across um, the agency on how we can be more um, intentional about interweaving 
those pieces so that we can be more have have kids be more engaged in the classroom. And we understand that advising is a core tenant and the career connections framework is a planning tool for districts to provide students with opportunities to really develop that vision and realistic plan for their future. And this framework specifically is aligned to the aligns many of the efforts around college and career readiness to support students to becoming productive and engaged citizens. And so when we think about this framework, we understand that um, it's not, we see it as a linear path, but we understand that it's cyclical. We know that when kids transition from K through five into six through eight, that they don't stop having moments of awareness, uh, that they are even in some cases, maybe doing some planning. And we know that even our K through five kids are getting opportunities to do career exploration. And definitely our kids in our nine through 12 are still having those elements of awareness are still doing exploratory options through work-based learning or internships, pre apprenticeships and so on, while they're also planning. Um, so this is uh, always consider how we can change how that looks to make it more um, visually aware that it's a cyclical process, but um, I always try to make sure that we're emphasizing that as well. Uh, in addition, we have our interventions for students who are at risk of dropping out. So in legislation, it states that for students who are at risk of dropping out, districts have to have a early warning indicator tool that's locally established to help um, identify those students. And we really want to make sure that this is happening in our middle grade. So starting uh, with a tool that can help support identifying students in those, you know, sixth through eighth grades uh, so that we can provide the, the wraparound services and supports they need to um, help support them in staying in school. And in addition, we know that our students who have been identified need to be placed on student success plans. And these can be locally established or can use the state model plan, which um, that state model plan we know is, is dated. It is something that we've been kind of tearing around this idea of how to properly approach this now that we have this graduation plan. And so one of the things that I just encourage until we can figure out how to properly do this, because we want to make sure we do it right the first time, um, is one thing is with our grad plans and our student success plans, there's nothing in legislation that says that they can't live in the same record, that they can't be on the same document. So if we, you use the, the model grad plan, that Excel template, and you're like, okay, we're going to add tabs that specifically address the areas and elements for a student success plan. And we're going to start kids. We understand that this has to happen in the middle grades. So we're going to use this now new record that has both of those elements of student success and grad plan pieces. And we're going to start all our middle grade kids, sixth and sixth grade, and looking at those student success elements, making sure that they have areas of self-awareness and areas of um, whatever those specific pieces are in a very individualized and personalized way. And we know that this is going to transition with them into the high school because we use this grad template specifically for our high school. So there's there's a win-win here. One, it's winning for the kids because it's starting them off early and really thinking critically about their future. It's making sure that they see and are engaged in a plan that's gonna support them in graduating high school and also transitioning this work from you know, middle grade counselors, the high school counselors is going to help strengthen the conversations and build relationships with kids and making sure we're preparing them for um, their transition uh, into graduating high school and uh, post high school. So I just encourage if that's something that you've maybe stumbling upon, like how in the world are we going to do this? Um, there's some similarities here, but they're two different pieces of legislation. There's nothing that says they can't live in the same record. Um, and I'm hoping, you know, one day that we can get to a place where we can have a, a state level um, dual record like that that we can share. So another piece of legislation is around career pathways. It's just making sure that in your policies, you're articulating how students are getting that awareness and exploration around career pathways. And I know this is a very busy slide, uh, but one of the key things in um, the redesigned Ohio Means Jobs K-12 uh, website is their dynamic career pathways tool. So this tool allows students to um, explore occupations within a career cluster in a very new way. Uh, so as they do, let's say their career interest survey and they find that business management administration is one of their top um, career clusters and they start to just dig down deep and explore that, they can now see 
um, where those careers and occupations lie on one page. So thinking about where are those entry level opportunities for me? Is this something that I can engage in now while I'm in high school? Um, what if I know that I want to uh, do a four, four year or more college degree? Like I know I want to go, where are those occupations um, that would align to my interest and where I wanna go in my academics? And then are there on and off ramps for those careers and occupations? So um, these arrows and dotted lines help have those conversation with kids to say, hey, if you start here, there's a pathway actually for you to, to advance into some of these other areas or there's maybe a, um, a relationship between careers within um, a pathway where you can have on and off ramps to explore other things as you're growing and developing into your, your core career options. So it's a really good tool to have those great conversations for kids to play and explore and learn about the occupations. And as they're saving these pathways to their profile in Ohio Means Jobs, um, they'll get the option to then look at what those academic um, suggestions would be K through post-secondary. So thinking about what courses would I need now um, in high school or, or even starting in middle grades um, where, where it's appropriate for maybe those middle grade career tech opportunities to start planning out my academic pathway to make sure that I am ready for these occupations. And when we're thinking about career pathways, we want to make sure we're being inclusive of our educators. So making sure that we are informed as a district and what educator training is available so that we can make sure that our, our educators are prepared for the, the onslaught of future work. We know that there's a lot coming in our backyard in Ohio for um, occupations and industries that are really looking at us in a, in a positive way. But with that comes, um, career fields and things that we're just may not be familiar with. Um, and we wanna share our, our educators are equipped so that they can educate our kids and make sure they're getting connected. And I wanted to give an example of how uh, you can do that is through the, one of the examples is the Manufacturing and Engineering Externship uh, or the MEEP. And this is a paid summer externship with local companies in STEM industry. So this is just one of many examples here in Ohio. Um, but I just wanted to inform like there are options and ways for student for educators to engage with business and industry to make sure they're prepared um, to support students in exploring these future careers. And so some of these other core tenets we're thinking about are, of course, our career pathways to earn a high school diploma. So making sure your policies articulate how students are engaging in those pathways and earning those seals. Uh, what credit flexibility options are available to them, both from an academic and career tech um, lens. And then um, articulating how you're documenting students uh, for career advising. Are you using Ohio Means Jobs, their career plan, uh, where uh, it helps students build and explore and learn about a potential pathway post high school? And you can actually uh, add and personalize pieces of a career plan for a student <clears throat> within that system. Or are you using a locally defined system? Um, so just making sure those things are articulated in your policy uh, is significant. And then also thinking about successful post-secondary transitions. Um, how are interventions for mediation, remediation being handled from a district level? Uh, and then also how are you communicating to families and students about information on career fields that may require industry recognized credentials, certificates, associates, and so on. <clears throat> And so here's the new piece of legislation that came out in July. So this also has to involve the successful post-secondary transition piece. So this came out in July of 2022, uh, and it was around resources for cost saving for cost savings for post-secondary education and programs. And it gives a list of uh, some of some examples of what those programs are. And so the Chancellor of Higher Education was the one who was tasked to develop informational materials that illustrate those cost saving estimates. Um, and you can find those on this web page here. Uh, and I think, okay, I'll have to share it after. It won't let me highlight it from my notes, but I can share a direct link um, and, you know, during, during um, Q&A so that you guys have access to that. So that's just one of the, uh, that's the, the new piece of legislation, just making sure that um, 
you're informed of what those affordability strategies are so that you can make sure you're articulating those with students and families. And of course, your counselors have that in their tool, their toolkit as they're supporting um, students and making those decisions for post high, post high school success. And so lastly, when we're thinking about legislation, it's just inform just the foundational pieces. In 2015-16, districts had to adopt a policy on career advising. Um, those policies needed to be posted um, in a public facing uh, place on the district's website and that these policies are then go through a biannual review by their local board. Uh, 2023 is a biannual year for review. So this is a great time to be getting this information about the career advising toolkit um, so that you as district leaders um, can be thinking critically about how you can amplify and personalize um, and transition your career advising policies into high engaging plans. So before I transition to the toolkit, does anybody have any questions uh, regarding policy or any of the elements that we spoke of um, around what is expected and required around career advising? No? Okay. I just have one question. Does, um... How do you know that it's being, is it every school district has to review it every two years after the, after 2023? And how do you know that's being done? Do you spot check? Well, um, the only thing in legislation is that districts have to post it on their website. There's no um, compliance from a state level that says that they have to submit anything to the state to validate that this is happening. Um, so it is something that is just managed locally, um, and, and that's, uh, as of right now, that's, that's really all we have. <laughs> okay, thank you. You're welcome. We have asked in the past kindly, because that's what, the only thing we can do, we can't enforce it, but we have asked in the past for, for people to share their policies so that we can kind of just learn um, what's happening. Um, and most of them have just been the, um, the legislative language. And so one of the core pieces, purposes of the toolkit is to, to help, because it's not an easy lift to, to think to the depth of what career advising is. It's not an easy lift to really think about it from a systemic lens. Uh, so the toolkit is just a supporting tool to help districts along the process of really elevating and highlighting the high quality work that's happening locally and so that everybody can articulate the value of their career advising policies. And then hopefully we can get some really, really good um, examples of high quality career advising uh, plans across the state. So this was kind of leading into the next piece is where did this career advising toolkit come from? Um, so in during the pandemic, it was like that unveiled glare of disproportionality and access and opportunity within the nation's educational ecosystem. And um, in it rose an opportunity for education community to really uh, sit down and think critically about within our sphere of influence, where do we have opportunity for change? Um, in many conferences and conversations, I was hearing um, some people speak from a glass half empty perspective, and I heard people speak from a glass half full perspective. So I took in and received all of the information I was getting, and I started to think about career advising as, as a really good place to create some high quality change uh, to support districts and, of course, ultimately our students. And so I started to think, okay, how can we think beyond the framework of career advising and facilitate a perspective of fixing the water source rather than accepting a half cup of water? Um, and so the toolkit is, was designed as a catalyst for really transforming policy into actionable, locally driven, equitable student-centered career advising plans. And it, so it was designed, there was a need. We saw that there was a need um, to develop um, a process to illuminate the through points between policy and practice. 
Um, and so I worked very closely with others within the agency in partnership with local career advisors and school counselors and um, CTE leaders in building out this toolkit and planning template. And they were designed as a self-assessment for districts and schools uh, to focus on policy and plan development across and within the areas of the Career Connections Framework. There we go. And so it was designed for local leaders to start to understand the importance of career advising and the factors within, uh, or what I like to call the building between, that impacts and helps shape the lives of the students served through establishing sustainable student-centered career advising plans. And you know, we have to first understand policy's purpose is really that high level view. Um, and we are the worker bees, we are the ones who do the actions on the ground, um, but there's a building between us. There's these factors that live between us that feeds information from both sides. And I wanted to start thinking about critically about where within those factors do we have opportunity to really strengthen our career advising policies um, and grow. And so we started thinking about the Career Connections Framework. We understand that that's the planning tool to support districts to provide students with opportunities to develop their realistic plans for the future. And so I wanted to think about the factors or those actions that exist across and within the operations of career advising. And we looked across different states and other national research bodies to kind of glean in this understanding of what those factors are or the building between, if you will. Uh, and that's where these factors erupt from. <clears throat> we saw consistent trends on supporting students in self-awareness, uh, academic support, advising, college and career exposure, college application and enrollment, family knowledge and engagement, military enlistment, professional development, which are all very familiar to the work that we do as a state. Um, but I think they might have been happening sometimes, um, not necessarily in silos, but um, just linear to one another where there was opportunity for cross engagement. So this is a hope to really pull those pieces together into a high quality career advising plan. And so the toolkit is separated out into four parts. So I wanted to design this in a way that somebody who knows nothing about Ohio's legislation around career advising or the framework can pick this up, understand it in, in a high level way in which they could then go and develop high quality plans that can be sustained and monitored. And then, you know, obviously supporting those who are champions uh, in our local space to support their district in walking through a process to analyze and think critically about their current career advising policies and um, bringing together high quality stakeholders to establish a newly redesigned plan that can be then again sustained and monitored. So the process um, was to help stakeholders, local district stakeholders, inform and design intentional strategies around the legislative components that we just spoke about and your local advising needs. Um, also inform district career advising policy. So thinking about uh, them being one and the same and then inform the development of strategies and action steps to support the sustainability of career advising successes. Um, the ultimate goal is to um, get to a place where uh, we can start to um, champion and highlight high quality career advising plans across the state to be exemplars uh, and to build on that. Um, so I, I was trying to figure out how we can do this as a tool where it can be sustained and monitored and, and reviewed and shared in a high quality way. Uh, but again, this cannot be done without thinking about the, your local educational ecosystem and being very intentional about having diverse and inclusive stakeholders. Uh, because this is a whole child, this is a whole student initiative and it crosses many areas and aspects of the educational system. And so you wanna make sure that you're, you're considering making sure that your counselors, your teachers from your local lens are are, have not only a seat at the table, but they have an active voice in the development. Your student and family, your business community, your school and your district leaders, uh, making sure that everybody not only has a seat at the table, but they are actively engaged in the development um, and, and the development process of your career advising plans. 
And one of the things I like to highlight is leveraging business advisory councils. This gives you a space of um, where you already have business community leaders who are already raising their hand to be um, a partner in education. Um, using business advisory councils also gives you um, a already well-oiled um, process to enter into because career advising is 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 a core is a core part. It might be an underlining unspoken, but it's a core part of what uh, career advising councils are their purposes for is developing and designing programming and establishing um, internships and apprenticeships for students. So this should be a, a common language already established, and it gives a place where you can interweave in the agendas that already exist in a physical space for um, your teachers and counselors, your student and family members to come and be a part of a cohesive group and thinking critically about career advising. And it also supports many of the goals of the Career Advising Council as well to be engaged in this work. Um, so I try to ampl amplify that as like a good foundation to, to start this work from. Um, in addition to having this diverse and inclusive stakeholder group, it really helps broaden the lens of knowledge and establish clarity about the successful implementation and long-term sustainability of Ohio's career advising strategic priorities. And another great thing is it helps them build the background responsibilities of career advising. Sometimes when we hear that, we think solely about career counselors or school counselors when um, everybody really has a, a part in, in the process and development and implementation of career advising from your business partners to your students to your district and local building leadership. Uh, so this really, this process really helps unveil those responsibilities. And ultimately it helps create and refine a system to build pathways for college and career readiness for all students. And of course we want to make sure we're providing ample focus on our, um, our middle grades is getting that exposure. Um, so the next thing that I wanted to pull is like site navigation where in the world do you even find this information? So I wanted to make sure I spent some time sharing where you find this information. Um, so if you go to the department's website and you, um, in, the, in, the, um, in the box here, you just put in career connections, you'll go to our main landing page. Uh, and from here, you'll find career advising right here. And what's great is uh, this website is designed so that you can engage in the career advising toolkit straight from the website. Um, or you can print the document. So there's a couple different ways to engage in the work. Uh, I wanted to make sure that there was flexibility in how to engage, but everything that you need is here to engage in the toolkit. Um, one of the things that I did wanna call out that is a part of this um, document is legislatively the state, of, we, we at the state have to have a um, student success clearing house of evidence-based practices for um, those student success indicators. And so under the career advising and student success and graduation plan component of the toolkit is where you can um, find tools and resources to uh, look at evidence-based practices, research, um, and high, uh, high quality strategies around uh, several different areas of student student success. So you can leverage that using the Info Ohio Open Space platform, um, or you can use the Ohio's evidence-based clearinghouse. So that's something that was just recently added to the website that I wanted to make sure was emphasized today. Um, <clears throat> so that's where you find it on the website. So before I get there, um, Okay, so before I go to the train the trainer, just to give you a view of what the toolkit physical document, so it's everything that's on the website, it's just in a document. So if you like something tangible, you can print this out, you can print all the resources out so you have, well, some of these are online resources, but the templates, they're all here readily available for you if you prefer to do it that way. And I just noticed I need to update this because <laughs> we do have the cost savings. Um, so that resource is there. So the next thing that I want to share with you is the train the trainer. And this is one that as district leaders, you're like, yes, this is a biannual review year. I really want to take the opportunity 
to step into this idea of thinking critically about how we are engaging in career advising uh, here in our district. The Train the Trainer has is developed specifically to make sure that um, to empower you to, to facilitate stakeholders through the career advising toolkit because understanding that it, the toolkit is there's a lot there's a lot of pieces and parts um, so I developed the train the trainer to make sure you're able to digest it in an, uh, an easier way so it's divided into two phases and it provides all the resources you need to successfully lead the work from implementation to launch um, but one of the things that I always say uh, as you're stepping into this work is to think big, start small and scale fast. And this was a learning from the, um, we did a, a pilot a couple years back. And so one of the things that we saw that had high value is, you know, thinking what is our big goal and starting small and how they can scale it. And, you know, we wanna make sure that you're looking at this work and thinking about how is it going, how is it supporting the five tenets of Ohio's whole child framework? How does this, you know, align with Future Forward Ohio? And then also looking at um, how is this advancing your district and local strategic goals? So you're making sure that before starting the process, you're already making those those alignments on how this work has high value and can integrate into the things that you're already doing. Um, and then starting small, and this could be addressed in various of ways. It could be your stakeholder size, or, and I'm getting ahead of myself speaking to this, but of focusing on a particular area of educational equity. Um, maybe that's how you start. And then of course, after that, you would scale fast. So taking what you've done, scaling it and expanding it across your district. So that first phase is looking at um, your full stakeholder group. So looking at that diverse and inclusive stakeholder group, thinking about the the scale of your business advisory council. We understand that these might be large body stakeholders, several individuals. Um, how can you how can you leverage that many people in a high quality way to do the work that you're trying to do? So thinking about splitting this group into a co-design team and an advisory group. So when you think about a co-design team, this could be a collective of key stakeholders um, who have both high impact and high influence. <clears throat> and are equal collaborators throughout the toolkit process. Uh, this could be a business advisory lead, a business partner, a community partner, um, a core district leader, a school level administrator, and so on. I think another key piece is making sure that if there is a um, student population or a targeted student population that you're looking to do some focalized work around, um, creating space for them to have a seat at the table as a co-designer. So giving them space to be a co-collaborator in the work and not just um, a voice at the table giving their opinions, but really allowing them to be, uh, get their, you know, their, their hands and feet, dirt, hand and feet dirty in the process. I think it's very, very important. <clears throat> and then your advisory group can be defined as a larger collective of stakeholders that have low impact, but high influence. Um, and these individuals could be, um, you know, they would give strategic advice and feedback throughout the process. And this could be additional district uh, district business advisor councils or um, maybe regional state support team, local school board members, career technical planning district leaders. And this is examples, right? These, these things could be intermixed within co-design and advisory group, but just thinking critically about how you can break down such a large body of stakeholders in a very effective way so that everybody plays a role. <clears throat> so that would be the first phase before stepping into the career advising toolkit is establishing uh, your teams. And then once you've done that, um, you would then just uh, develop and create your meeting cadence. Um, looking at when you're gonna meet, who's gonna, you know, how often are things going to happen? Um, and you'll align to the structures of existing leadership and advisory schedules is a really good step. So looking at your business advisory schedule as like the primary step of developing out that meeting cadence. And then you're going to follow the toolkit workflow uh, from there. And I say that casually, but it is a lot. But I the 
the, the train and trainer has a lot of great tools to walk you through. Um, and I'm going to share that now. <clears throat> and I don't think I've been sharing things the way I think I've been sharing them, have I? <laughs> I don't think I have. Now you guys can see it. So I apologize. I was sharing things thinking you guys were seeing them and you guys were not seeing them. My apologies. We were um, seeing slides. The slides, yeah. I had at one point, I shared this. I shared this thinking you guys were seeing it and you weren't. So I apologize. Um, I, I will make sure you guys get all the links though. Um, so you don't miss out on any of that information. But the train the trainer, um, this piece here, uh, I just wanted to share, like when you go through this process, what I wanted to do is I wanted to make sure that um, I was taking out as much of the guesswork as I possibly could so that people are encouraged and feel empowered to do this work. Uh, so in this, I've laid out an entire meeting cadence for you. Um, it gives you who should be, like what the overview of each of the sessions are going to be, the time frame that is generally needed, and this was based off of the pilot that we did, uh, and then what is your target audience? Is it going to be both your co-design and advisory teams or, or just the code, you know, so it's there. I also have presentation slides. Each of these slides have all of the talking points and on all of it. So even you have slide deck, you won't have to guess like what, how in the world do I, I articulate what we're supposed to be doing today. The, the, everything is there. I left them in PowerPoint form so that you can modify them in a way that is appropriate and indiv individualized for you as a district. So you can build on them in a way that's appropriate. And then I have all the resources that you would need for that session. <clears throat> and that continues on throughout the process. So you don't have to, I was like, I looked through the toolkit and I was like, I don't want people to, to overwhelm themselves with this because it's a lot of work, but it's such good work. I want to just do as much as I could um, and give as many examples as I could as possible to, to make sure that you're, you're, you're supported well. Uh, so every step of the way, the educational equity gap analysis tool, you got you got complete guidance on how to walk your your stakeholders through this process. Doing the evidence based collection piece, you have all the tools and resources that you'll need to be effective in that space. There's a notice and wonder activity because one of the key things that is important um, before thinking about how to establish strategic goals around career advising is understanding your own educational ecosystem. What is happening? What does our educational equity look like? Who are our, where are the trends <clears throat> for our students? Uh, how, we, how we are serving them um, from a career advising and student success lens. Uh, so this, this piece of data review is, has high value and it has a lot of significance. Um, and so that's why there's so much um, dedicated in this toolkit process to really thinking deeply about um, the educational equity that you have locally. And then there's additional tools and resources to think about um, strategic plans around what you have learned from your, um, your review of educational equity. <clears throat> and I wanted to make sure I called out ones for specific population groups uh, just to get conversation started, just to give a point of reference on where you can you know, pull sources from. Uh, thinking about non-traditional pathways or career success for students with disabilities and broadening participation in STEM, just to give a few examples. Um, and then it goes through making the plan. You have all of this background knowledge of what your educational equity looks like. You were able to really dig down and identify some root causes, pull resources to say, here's how we can be strategic in uh, supporting students and career advising and student success around these areas. Now that we have all of this knowledge, now we can be very intentional about creating some high quality um, career advising plans that um, have influence and um, um, feedback from our entire uh, stakeholder group. So we know how our business community partners are going to help support um, making sure that by our, by once our students are uh, juniors, they will have exposure to an internship with this particular partner. 
um, maybe it's all juniors. This partner has been a part of the process. They see the value. They this has happened in our pilot. Their their partner was their business partner was like, you know what? I now understand. Um, we're going to make sure that every junior has an internship opportunity with us at some point. That's powerful. Um, and so just to give you an example, so there's really great ways for people as local leaders and district leaders to write in how they are going to be um, an influence in career advising as a district whole. Um, it could be family and um, family engagement, family and parent engagement uh, might be a local uh, principal saying, okay, I'm going to make sure that in our plan, we are going to articulate that building principles are providing an allotted amount of time for a specific type of engagement activity with family and parents. Um, so it, it gives a lot of insight into be to create power uh, around career advising, um, but it gives you a place to then monitor that, to review that, that, see if it's sustainable. It gives you a place of foundation to create change and shift and grow. Um, where everybody's on one accord and understanding the, like the main goals. What is the true vision and mission around career advising in a local space? <clears throat> and then landing that plan. So in the next biennial review, you have a lot to work with. You've, you've developed a plan, you've been able to monitor it and review it and see change. And you're able to articulate that in that next biennial review to say, here's where we started, here's where we can go. So it gives you a, a quality foundation where everybody can speak and articulate to what is happening around career advising in our district, and here's where we, we would like to go with it, and here's where we are today. <clears throat> so that's the whole purpose of the toolkit. Um, and so that is that piece. Um, trying to watch time. Um, so this is just another um, slide that just talks about the workflow. You'll go through that introductory meeting, gap analysis, evidence collection, notice and wonder and root cause, uh, then you will start to build and make your plan. Then you will uh, develop a sustainability and monitoring process for that. You'll launch it. And then to land the plan is in your biannual review. Uh, these are just some highlights from the pilot that we, that we did. Um, it was with the Columbiana County Business Advisory Council was their core. Uh, this gives you an idea of who their co-design and advisory council team was, and then some of the um, development outcomes that they had, which I thought were really great. And this is just a few of many. Um, I didn't want to put their whole plan out there because uh, this would be a very busy <laughs> slide, but I just wanted to highlight some really great things that, that came out of that work. And so that is what I have for today. I know it was a lot of information. Um, <clears throat> But please, if you have questions, I am happy to answer them. Closing the right things. And I can share this slide deck um, with the group as well so that you have this to reference. Thanks, Kayla. I know that was going to be one of their questions. So um, you can send that to me and I'll put it in the tools um, that we share out after the meeting. Okay. In the email, I'll put all the links too. So you get it, you get it in one place. Perfect. Thanks so much. Yeah. It's a lot to digest. There's a lot there. Yeah, it is, and but it's, it's, it's good work. I am happy to be a part of any conversations or support needs. If this is something that you're looking at doing and you want to have conversations with other district leaders, um, or local leaders, or maybe your business advisory council, myself, if it's a business advisory council piece, you know, we can always pull in Michelle from my team and we can, you know, have a tag team conversation of why this is good to do. Um, so please just let me know and I'd be happy to, to help you out. Sure. I was really, what you, when you started talking about the early warning um, indicators and that student success plan and grad plan to live in the same document, that's, that's really helpful um, because if they really start planning for those kids that are off track in middle school and the different things we can do, like using the career, the career pieces too, to help keep them engaged, then just transitioning that to the high school um, would make things so much easier for them. Yeah. Yeah, most definitely. 
Keisha, did you have a question? No. This is a lot of information, but it's great information and I can't wait to sit and scroll and read through it. Um, you're a lifesaver because <laughs> this process is not easy. And mm -hmm. I find that we've been um, just doing different pieces of it. So it hasn't been like a, a seamless process. Like this is step one, step two, step three. So thank you, thank you, thank you for this. Absolutely. Yeah, and I hope this helps unveil um, like connectedness across other areas of like some of, even some of the monitoring pieces that are coming down the state. You'll see some relevance where going through this toolkit is going to help inform some other things that are required from the state to say, okay, we can speak to this because we went through this process. <clears throat> um, so I hope to see that, I hope you're able to see in some of the correlations across that to help support some of the, the larger scale um, pieces coming out of the state for requirements and things. Anybody have any questions? I know it's a lot to, to process. So you're, if you're like me, you need a little bit more time and you might think of a question later today or tomorrow. And if you do, um, in our presentation, I've got Kayla's email um, that I'll send to you as well. So you can ask her directly. Happy to answer. Oh, and I was supposed to share about Ohio Main Shops. So apologies. So if you don't know by now, ohiomainsjobs.com is going through a, another redesign. Um, and May 5th, um, all users, including students, will have to use OHID to access the platform. <clears throat> I've been working diligently with Job and Family Services and Monster to make sure that that process um, was going to be appropriate for students. Um, making sure that what they entered was appropriate and then also streamlining the process and simplifying it for our kids. And so that they, they have honored that. Um, what's really great about this change is that once students create their OHID and they, if they already have an Ohio Meets Jobs account, they will be prompted to add in their login and password for Ohio Meets Jobs and it will connect the two and they will never have to sign into Ohio Means Jobs again. They will only have to shine into OHID. What's really great about this, it's going to eliminate kids making um, job seeker accounts on accident. So when you get kids who create accounts and then they're like, well, we try to sign in and it's telling us that we don't have an account, but then if we do it this way, it says, you know, so, it's gonna eliminate them going to the wrong place, which is great. That's one of the biggest pain points, I think. And they'll also have more, um, more authority to uh, reset passwords. So if they have an issue with their password, they have more authority to make those changes. <clears throat> so that is the high value. It's gonna be, I mean, it's, it's a growing pain because it's a transition in system. Um, it's a new thing to learn. Um, Job and Family Services has been hosting trainings uh, throughout this month, and I will add that link to the, the upcoming trainings uh, so that you guys have access to those. Even though they're four different um, regions, you can still attend the virtual sessions. It's still the same information. Um, there's a handful of them left, so I encourage you to um, go to one, and it'll walk through that OHID process and what it fully looks like for a student. You know, you're going to get everything from a job seeker to a, a to a business person, but there is an element for, for the kids that are, is very, very valuable for you to have that information. Another change is that we see they have a, a profile. It's now going to be a dashboard, which is going to be more action driven. So it's going to be more leading them into engagement activities instead of them just clicking around and it not having relevance to like building a plan. They just know we've got to do this and this and this. It's just, it's more engaging, I think. It's more action-driven where there's more function. I still say use the guided tour to keep them focused and safe <laughs> and not going out of the system and going everywhere, um, but there's it's good. Um, so I, I'm excited to see where things are going. Um, for our, our SST and tech prep friends, we do have a regional 
um, a regional role in the um, Ohio Made Shops admin tool. So that just rolled out. Uh, I know many SST folks have ours, we're trying to get theirs fixed, but uh, we'll have a regional role where you can now see regional level data for, for, your, for your area on activity around the high meets job. So you can start to monitor and see those things and help you in your work in articulating how you can create programming or see opportunities to build um, career um, connections for kids. So a lot of good things are happening. Yeah, and I just encourage you um, even to share that information about the Ohio Means Jobs training with people in your district who are um, maybe using it more often than maybe you on the call because, um, like Kayla said, that change is happening May 5th. So um, I went to the one of the trainings, and so that means on May 8th, if the students don't have the OHID account, they'll be redirected to that. Mm -hmm. And you all know that getting getting kids um, to go through those steps to sign in. Um, it'll take a little bit of time. Like um, Kayla said, it'll be a little bit of a growing pain, but I just want you guys to be aware of that so you can think through how you want to share that information um, with your teachers um, and make sure tech's involved so that all the addresses are whitelisted. Yes, that was the next thing I was going to say. Please, please, please make sure. Um, <clears throat> I'm also working with Jobs and Family Services to get as much content as I can so I can build a how-to for educators to help kids walk it through. So it's mostly what you're going to see in these trainings, but I wanted to have something physical um, posted on the website so that you can download it and have it. You can, or, you know, even one for kids. Uh, that was my ultimate goal. Like, I hate that we're changing this again because a lot of educators have already created tools for kids to have and walk through a process that is now completely different. So I was like, okay, I'm, I just need to make one. I need to just do it for the teachers so they don't have to yet do it again. Um, I, so if you guys have any ideas on what that should look like, that'd be very helpful for me because I have my Oh, no, Kayla. We dropped Kayla. There she is. Oh, <laughs> oh I think she's still frozen. I just, um, I, I don't want to uh, scare people about the process, but the Ohio means jobs piece. I remember when I was a classroom teacher, you know, we had a systemic way of making sure that in this class, in this grade, this is when the account got set up. And then, you know, now that most districts are one-to-one, -one, kids are going to have an email address. And so you can, um, I'm not sure what happened. I think my oldest got home. So he's probably on his video games with, oh. <laughs> that's all right. Well, I think I was just telling them that if they can plan through, you know, how they're what email addresses and things they're going to use for the students that that's really helpful too. So, all right. Well, if you guys don't have any more questions, we'll go ahead and finish um, for today. Um, I'll send out the link again to um, the feedback. And if you have um, and I'll also send out the recording and things. Um, after I get the, the video rendered from YouTube. So thanks so much for joining us today. And I'm going to go ahead and stop recording. And if you have a question, feel, you know, after I stop, go ahead and ask. Kayla, thank you so much for joining us. I really appreciate it.